Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lansman, and welcome to my ninth COVID-19 Town Hall. We do enjoy this time together, but we also look forward to the day when we don't need to have these town halls at all. That was Sarah Bareilles singing Opening Up, uh, opening up our town hall on the subject of reopening. I'm very proud to represent the neighborhoods of Kew Gardens Hills, Pominock, Electchester, Fresh Meadows, Hillcrest, Jamaica Estates, Briarwood, Parkway Village, Jamaica Hills, and Jamaica. And no, I am not really conducting this town hall from in front of my old elementary school, PS 164 in Kew Gardens Hills. That is my virtual background. I hope you are receiving our daily COVID-19 email updates and seeing them on Facebook. If you are not and wish to sign up, there is a link to sign up on my COVID-19 information webpage on my city council website. That's council.myc.gov. You'll find me and you'll find my webpage. Sign up for our daily email. It really is very informative. My COVID-19 information page also has an archive of daily emails and town halls since the onset of the pandemic. Our district office is open for business virtually. Um, nobody's there, but the phones and emails all get forwarded to my uh, terrific staff. So you can call us with any problems, issues, questions, concerns, suggestions that you have at 718-217-4969. You can email us at rlansman at council.nyc.gov. You can tweet at us at, at Rory Lansman, or you can send us a message via Facebook. If you want to get to us, it's easy to get to us, and we will do our best to, to help you and to solve whatever issue you're having. Now, Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio have said phase one of reopening New York City will be this Monday, June 8th. The five boroughs, we are the only region in New York State that has yet to partially reopen under the governor's unpause plan. The plan divides the state into 10 regions and tracks seven metrics, all of which must reach specific benchmarks prior to beginning the path to restarting. The metrics were designed to ensure the infection rate is sufficiently low. The healthcare system has the capacity to absorb a potential resurgence in new cases. That diagnostic testing capacity is sufficiently high to detect and isolate new cases. And that robust contact tracing capacity is in place to help prevent the spread of the virus. New York City is in the clear on five of seven metrics. We are still short on the number of available hospital beds and active contact traces, tracers. So we're five for seven. That said, it is unclear if the events of the past week will push back Monday's expected unpause. Now the mayor said this morning that reopening Monday is still on. The governor, however, was non-committal. I hope and I assume that these decisions will be made on the science, on the merits, and um, we will reopen as soon as possible um, but not rush our reopening because we don't want to have to go back to where we were just a month or so ago. For businesses, phase one reopening includes construction, agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting. Not a lot of agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting in Queens, I got to acknowledge. Retail limited to curbside or in-store pickup, manufacturing, and wholesale trade. Religious gatherings will still be limited to 10 people or less, and key elements of reopening and compliance with state regulations include limiting your staff to one employee per 250 square feet for indoor work and ensuring a distance of at least six feet between them, creating and posting a COVID-19 health and safety plan, training staff on state-issued safety guidelines, screening employees for COVID-19 systems symptoms each day, providing personal protective equipment to staff, adhering to CDC hygiene and sanitation requirements, and for retail, in-store pickup is defined as a customer 
placing an order for a specific item by phone or internet in advance, then collecting the order at the retail location. The retail location must abide by physical distancing requirements, which will prohibit occupancy within the location for no more than 50% of the maximum occupancy, including both employees and customers. And customers are only allowed on the premise to retrieve their prearranged order, not to browse or, or place an in-person order. And customers must maintain six feet of space from others and wear a face covering. Phase two of reopening will begin four weeks after phase one begins, as long as all seven metrics are still met. Now, this afternoon, um, we have some great panelists who are joining us. We had wanted a mix of um, uh, government officials, which is us, the uh, um, business community, a couple of different perspectives from the business community, um, the, uh, and, and, and from uh, faith leaders and the, the faiths that, that are mainly represented in my district because one of the questions that we get uh, almost uh, more than any other is um, you know, related to people's permission, ability to uh, worship and to attend religious services. And so um, we, we have representatives from the Muslim community, the Jewish community, um, and the Protestant community. We had a representative from um, the diocese, uh, the Catholic community, um, but um, uh, he had an emergency at the last minute and cannot uh, join us. And um, it, actually the representative from the diocese was former um, uh, head of the New York City Emergency Management uh, Joe Esposito. So um, I certainly understand that his expertise and talents might get called away at the, the last moment. But we've got a great, a great uh, group of panelists. So now what we're going to do is um, we're going to introduce our panel and uh, ask each uh, representative, uh, each person, um, to speak for you know three, four, five minutes, two minutes, whatever you you want. Um, tell us. Uh, how uh, you've been doing, or, or in the case of like the Chamber of Commerce, how the business community has been doing, what preparations they're making to, to, for this new phase of reopening, um, and what people can expect uh, in terms of how Monday might look different than today. Uh, I'm going to go through our, 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 our panelists and then we'll, we'll call them in order. We have Neil Wagner, who is the Business Service program manager from the Queens Chamber of Commerce. I'm very glad to have him here. Uh, his boss, Tom Gretsch, uh, was going to be here, but he is testifying before the city council this afternoon. Um, Jennifer Ferrioli, who is the executive director of the Jamaica Center Business Improvement District at the start of my district in downtown Jamaica. We have Imam Shamsi Ali, who is the director of the Jamaica Muslim Center in uh, Jamaica Hills, Queens. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz, who is the executive director of the Vad Arabonum of Queens. And we have Reverend Chris De La Cruz, who is the associate pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Jamaica, also in downtown Jamaica. Let me just let, uh, we'll start with Neil, but let me just let um, those who are, are uh, 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 our audience know that if you want to ask a question and you are on the Zoom, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there is a Q&A function. Hit the Q&A function, ask your Q, and we'll try to get you in, in, in line to, to speak and get an A. If you are dialing in, you can uh, call, uh, excuse me, you can text. You can't do it via the screen, obviously. You can text your question to Sam Goldsmith, who's the behind the scenes uh, uh, moderator uh, of this uh, uh, Zoom town hall. Uh, his text is 347-498-4826. 347-498-4826. And his email is cd24sam at gmail.com, as in Council District 24, cd24sam at gmail.com. And we, when we get to the Q&A after the panelists have spoken, Sam uh, will put up uh, a panel, a slide on the screen um, for for, for people to, to know what to do. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome and to introduce Neil Wagner, who, as I said, the Business Service Program Manager 
for the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Neil, welcome. You're up. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, Councilman, uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me in the last minute here. Really do appreciate it. Um, as the Councilman said, my name is Neil Wagner. I'm the Business Service Program Manager at the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Um, so I run all of our state-funded economic development programs. Um, so the Queen's Chamber of Commerce, a little bit about our organization. We're the oldest business organization in Queens. We represent uh, over 1,100 members and through them, uh, 100,000 employees across the borough. Um, our three things that we always strive to do were to educate our members, connect them to the resources they need, and advocate for them and always be there for them uh, whenever they need it. And, and really the last, you know, 10, 12 weeks for everybody, it's really been a time where we've, we've needed to do that. Um, you know, traditionally our organization, we, you know, we're hosting a bunch of events, you know, at the Boulevard Center in Jackson Heights where we're at, or we're doing things all around the borough. Um, but now we've had to shift all of that content into something, you know, uh, digitally like this, you know, we've had a, a bunch of webinars, a bunch of meetings uh, across Zoom and WebEx and in every other platform you could imagine. Um, you know, we've been able to host events with the entire Queens uh, congressional delegation, some folks from the city council, uh, the lieutenant governor's office, and, you know, a bunch of other business leaders throughout the borough. And our, our main goal is just to then get getting information uh, for everybody, um, getting the right information into their hands that they need um, during this time. So, um, you know, right now, some other things that we're doing uh, to kind of help people uh, <clears throat> or business leaders through Queens, we're uh, shifting our, our economic development tool, Queens Best, which is a website that we had put together to help promote restaurants uh, throughout the borough. And we've, we've now used that as a tool to help let people know about the businesses that are still open, how to get in contact with them, how to, you know, place an order, you know, through DoorDash or Uber Eats or, or whatever the, you know, the platform might be. Um, we've also really, we've seen a lot of businesses step up and really help the community. So we started doing a Queens Chamber Business of the Week, um, which has been kind of fun to, to shine a little light on the people that are doing some good right now. So um, just for anybody out there, if you have a business that uh, you want to see get some recognition, please send your nominees to me um, at info at queenschamber.org. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all I have for right now. It's got to happen at least once a town hall where I talk and I'm still muted. Um, so with that, uh, we're now going to hear from Jennifer Ferrioli, who is the executive director of the Jamaica Center Business Improvement District. Uh, Jennifer, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so we are one of New York City's oldest business improvement districts. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary in November. Uh, council member spoke at our anniversary. Thank you, it was great to have you there. And um, we represent a long swath of Jamaica Avenue from Sufkin to 169th Street and about 400 businesses. Um, this has been a challenging time for us and for all business districts. Um, fortunately, I will say that New York City has a really wonderful cohort of economic development organizations, including the Chambers of Commerce and um, all of the 76 business improvement districts that immediately banded together. And so in the background, we've been exchanging information and best practices and ideas. And um, I would say, especially at the beginning of this process, when there seemed to to be new directives coming out every day, every hour. Um, it was, you know, like drinking from a fire hose for the businesses and for us organizations as well. And so a lot of what we did for the past few months was trying to stay on top of all of that information that was flowing quickly regarding um, financing, PPP, idle grant, um, safety guidelines, OSHA guidelines, anything like that. We were trying to quickly understand, synthesize, and then communicate. Um, so our website, jamaica.nyc, and the websites of many business improvement districts and other similar organizations now has a special COVID-19 resource page where we have divided all of this pertinent information into a one-stop shop. We want to make it as easy as possible for our businesses to find the information they need quickly. Um, we also pick up the phone and answer a lot of questions for those businesses as well. And then uh, Jamaica is very fortunate to actually have um, 
several organizations with business counselors. So we direct those businesses to those counselors. Um, and uh, what, what I'm working on now, and it's funny, what I was starting to work on before all of this happened was a resiliency plan for our district. And I know we're in the thick of this now, but this is not going to be the last time that we deal with something like this. Right before uh, coronavirus came, we actually had a bomb threat on Jamaica Avenue that closed down half of that avenue. And, uh, you know, in a year, it's going to be a steam pipe explosion or something else. And so, um, to me, this was just a reminder how important it is for businesses to have continuity plans, how important it is for business improvement districts to have continuity plans. And so, um, while we are working in the uh, relaunch and rebuilding phase, I'm also thinking about planning for the next disaster as well. And I encourage any businesses that are uh, watching this to also think ahead to the future. And um, there's a lot of resources already that are out there to help you plan for that. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Um, so now um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a dear friend um, and someone who I've known, uh, Imam Shamsi Ali, before I was an elected uh, official um, and really been um, a, a tremendous uh, civic leader um, in our community. So uh, Imam Shamsi Ali from the Jamaica Muslim Center, um, could you tell us and, and particularly uh, our Muslim uh, attendees, uh, how things have been going. I know the entirety of Ramadan was 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 during the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, a lot of decisions had to be made, um, and and you know hopefully things are they're opening up. But what 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 can you tell us about how the community's been doing, and and what community members might um, uh, expect uh, starting you know Monday or or in the weeks to come? Sam, uh, Imam uh, uh, Ali is still is still muted. Oh yeah, yes, yes. There we go. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, for this opportunity. Such an honor to join our honorable uh, panelists, um, and thank you for having a great friend to our community. Uh, you have helped us, uh, you know, making the the street in front of the masjid one way, and then also uh, turn the name into JMC Way, and uh, also the elderly home that we have at the community also because of your work. And so on behalf of the community, we thank you so very much for, you know, such a helpful work that you have done for us. Um, there is no doubt that members of our community um, are very willing to come back and worship God in the house of worship. Uh, but before talking about this, let me uh, introduce uh, myself to, to our panelists and the audience as well, that um, I'm the director of Jamaica Muslim Center and Imam. Uh, Jamaica Muslim Center is, possibly one of the largest community-based centers in the United States, particularly in New York City. We have um, over 5,000 members and uh, in our annual gatherings, we have even 10,000 people gather on the field. We have approximately every Friday service, uh, over a thousand people. Um, uh, on our daily congregational prayer, we have approximately 300 to 400 people. Um, we have. Uh, sisters classes, we have youth programs, we have interfaith programs, we have a lot of, and we have a full, 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 uh, uh, full time schools. We have a, a full time school from uh, kindergarten to high school called Al Ma'mur School. And we have also a special traditional school we call Midrash in the Jewish community. We call that Madrasa in Arabic language also in our community. Um, since the beginning of this pandemic, we have uh, closed our mosque for any public gatherings and we obey the, uh, the um, staying home protocols or social distancing protocols. We don't organize our Friday services. Uh, although we organize virtual sermons every Friday, uh, we didn't have any activities during the month of Ramadan that we consider is the most important month uh, for the Muslims to come together uh, as a community. We didn't do anything, no um, nightly prayer. Uh, there's not even Eid, which is one of the most important celebrations in the religion, and that is the, the end of Ramadan. Uh, and that's because we try to obey as much as we can uh, the, 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 self, the distancing, social distancing protocols. And so now since um, 
our attention had been shifted. Um, of course, this is one of the issues uh, that our attention had been shifted to another problem we are facing at these days. Uh, but also because we see the good signs that it's the, the coronavirus become, you know, down and slow. So we are very happy and looking forward to see uh, the opening. But even though we must, um, we, we are committed that the first and the most important is our well-being and the safety of our community. And secondly, we want to, we are all on the same boat. We, we want to fight together collectively, you know, against this virus. So we are still very, uh, you know, uh, with all precautions that we have, we are looking forward to the opening. Uh, but even let's say we are opening this Monday, uh, we are thinking of limiting ourselves uh, in attendance. Um, it depends on how we are going to ask the experts and also according to the regulations, of course, we are following. So we are going to limit the numbers. Secondly, the, the distance of six feet, of course, we have to observe. Uh, also, we are going to prepare um, hand sanitizer on the doors of the mosque. And uh, we uh, encourage everybody to have their own prayer mat. And everything is possible, you know, to, to, to take as any step as a part of our precautions to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, and we are going to have someone to enforce all this. Um, we are going to have our own security personnel and well, God wills, we are going to work very closely with the local prison as well. So again, uh, that's, we, we are preparing ourselves, but at the same time, we are very much have uh, you know, in mind every possible precautions because we know that this virus is not going away, uh, even though we feel that it's going down, but the virus is still around. So we are going to be very careful because our people's safety and our neighbor's safety is even more important than anything else. Thank you, Councilman Lansman. Thank you, Imam. Um, next uh, is Rabbi Chaim Schwartz, who's the Executive Director of the Vad Harabonim of uh, Queens. And uh, we too have known each other for a long time through, through various versions of, of Rory Lansman. Rory Lansman, the councilman, Rory Lansman, the assemblyman, Rory Lansman, the private citizen, Rory Lansman, the community board member. But you, sir, have been a constant, the leader of the Vad Harabonim of Queens, the day-to-day the, the, the -day operation. So uh, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz, uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Tell us uh, you know, what Jewish community, the Orthodox community has been uh, seeing and, and living through and some of the issues that, 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 that you've had to address. And, and how you think those things are going to evolve in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks? Sam, can you unmute him? I think Rabbi, you've got to touch something. Um, there we go. There I go. got it. Okay. Thank you very much, Councilman. I just want to thank you for hosting this meeting. And yes, so thank God we've been friends for many, many years. A wonderful, wonderful friend of our community. And uh, always fun to engage with at any time of the day or night. <laughs> uh, I also am very honored to be here on the panel with, um, with the Imam Ali and uh, Pastor Cruz and Neil and Jennifer and, uh, of course, uh, your great staff that put this together. Uh, I'm listening to Imam Ali. It's you know we have a lot in common as it as it comes to worship. Of course, worship in both of our faiths is extremely. I haven't heard from the pastor yet, but I'm sure he'll echo the same thing. It's extremely, uh, you know, central to our to our lives. Um, and the the challenge that we've been dealing with in in terms of the religious observance has been praying with the quorum. As you know, we we pray three times a day. And our synagogues have been closed basically since March 12th, which is, was, a, was a, uh, March 13th, excuse me, which is a Friday, uh, right after the holiday of Purim. And uh, it's been a subject of intense uh, discussion in our community, how, you know, and if we should reopen our synagogues. And uh, some synagogues have opened up already. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Governor Cuomo, I think it was about two weeks ago out of the blue, he allowed having uh, prayer gatherings of 10 people. So at that, at that time, there were synagogues that opened up with social distancing and of course with, you know, the necessary precautions of sanitizer and making sure that people weren't sitting next to each other and, you know, all, all the things that come with it. Uh, bringing prayer books from home, not allowing use of the, of the, com of the communal prayer books in the synagogue. Um, some synagogues did not open. Some synagogues wanted to wait uh, the two weeks, like, you know, a time, type of a quarantine period. 
just to make sure that everything was on the uh, everything was good on the up and up with the virus, making sure that it had, had at least started to to go down. Uh, but I, I can tell you that the, the religious observance and not praying with the synagogue and not praying with uh, with uh, with all the uh, excuse me one second. Um, the synagogue that and the and the uh, and the and not, and not being with community has had a terribly detrimental effect to the religious life, but also to the you know to the emotional aspect of of our community, uh, prayer and, and, and religious observance and religious uh, communal observance, communal prayer together is something which is central to all of our faith, um, and it's it's been something which has had a real effect on trying to you know get through this pandemic. Um, I guess maybe we didn't realize how much of an effect prayer had on on us and praying with the with the ten people with the minion as we call it, and you know not not to mention our schools and the kids having to learn at home, but that's really what we've been dealing with as a vod as a as an orthodox rabbinical organization. We've been dealing with the you know how to put our shoals back together, how to put our synagogues back together, how to come together and pray, and and how to do it in the safest way and. Thank God, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that our community has been able to really stick to the rules and abide by what the what the guidelines are. We've just gone through the holiday of Shavuot, the, you know, which is uh, which comes uh, seven weeks after the holiday of Passover. And uh, thank God, we uh, you know our communities have come through and able to really stick to the to the guidelines that we've had to. So that that's one aspect of, and, and I'll make it short, but that's one aspect of what we've been dealing with as a community. We've also been dealing with as a community. Um, there are a lot of different religious practices that entail having to leave the house and having to, you know, go to other places. And we've been, as rabbis, we've been dealing with these questions that we've never had to deal with before. We had the holiday of Passover, um, which was very unique, which is very unique to, to our, to, to the circumstances of COVID because you had people that Passover is such a, is a holiday where we all get together. I'm with my parents every year. I remember my being with my grandparents for the Seder as a child growing up. And here we, we told that we told our elderly and we told our children that they're not allowed to come. I have a married son and he was a newlywed and making Passover and, and, and getting the house ready and cooking all the food and, and it's a different type of food is no bread. You have to you have to basically start from scratch. Um, that was a challenge that we had to deal with as rabbis, how to guide our community in, in the different laws of Passover, the different laws of koshering, the different laws of, of cooking that people really were not familiar with. So. Uh, you know, from the clergy end of it, it's been really a, a time where we've we've seen we've seen we've had we have we've had uh, challenges that we've never been faced with before. And thank God, our community has come through with their flying colors, and we really look forward to the reopening on on Monday of some sort of normalcy, getting back to at least uh, on the road to uh, to where we have to get to. So I want to thank you again, Councilman, and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions down the road. And thank you again, all the uh, panelists, for your for your participation. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. And um, our third representative from the, the faith-based world uh, is uh, Reverend Chris uh, De La Cruz from First Presbyterian Church and the senior pastor there. I'm not sure if that's his official title, um, but the guy in charge, uh, Reverend Patrick O'Connor, um, has been a partner uh, on many projects, including the affordable housing that they're developing, uh, the uh, issue of the, the there was a, they were going to be a testing site a COVID testing site then they weren't and they were um and it's really just a, a a pillar in the community and he's a terrific guy and uh, uh reverend if uh, you could start just by reminding us just how old the church is because i think it goes back over a couple hundred years right oh that's right uh, you can all hear me right yes all right. Yes. So thank you so much, uh, Councilman. Yes. It, uh, First Presbyterian Church in Jamaica is over 350 years old. It might be at 360 now because we have a lot of these banners that they say uh, 350. So that's why that number is in my mind. But we've been uh, around a long time, even longer than the uh, Declaration of Independence, if I did my math right. Right. Um, but we're, uh, I'm very grateful to be on this panel and, and particularly grateful uh, Councilman for having our church on. We've yeah, partnered on, on many things, including affordable housing. And I, my understanding is you were instrumental in making sure we had that COVID uh, testing site. You know, you, you, had, a, you had some role. Uh, so, uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, 
But, you know, and thank you to all the panelists who have spoken so far. Uh, when, uh, you know, when it comes to the reopening and when it comes to just, uh, you know, dealing with this virus while uh, continuing to be the church, you know, our, our church community has had heavy hearts as, as everyone else. We've had multiple deaths in our community. A lot of folks, uh, I mean, close to me, close to us, uh, you know, the deaths and infections. I, the associate pastor, was actually infected with COVID-19 for over a month. I never had to be hospitalized, but um, it, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and so any discussion of reopening, uh, especially uh, in our leadership and with Reverend uh, Patrick O'Connor, our head pastor, we carry that heavy heart with what we experienced. But at the same time, even during the crisis, uh, we uh, were always a church. Uh, we, were, we always said what we want to do is to be who uh, a, a, that pillar in the community that to, you know, to show you know, what uh, we can do for each other while also being safe. So as soon as obviously uh, the city said uh, you know, no uh, religious gatherings, we immediately abided by that. At the same time, we said, well, even during this crisis, we know that people need us and we can serve both uh, uh, needs in person as well as virtually. So what that looked like is, well, in person, we continued our weekly food pantry uh, Tuesdays at 10 a.m. And then we continued our uh, soup kitchen. Of course, we didn't do you know, having people gather, but rather take out on Wednesdays at 5.30, and that's still going. And then as uh, the councilman mentioned, uh, we partnered uh, with the state and with uh, a community healthcare network and with others to have the first walkable COVID-19 testing site in the entire city. And as we know, the communities uh, that the councilman represents, uh, particularly as a number of folks who rely on public transit and, and you know, I, I need a, something place that's walkable. And so uh, through the uh, leadership of Reverend, uh, our head pastor, uh, Patrick O'Connor, uh, we and through the team, we were able to host that for, for many weeks, we've we uh, tested over 2,500 folks through that testing site. So that's the physical. And then uh, while uh, virtually, we uh, still were very active in terms of, you know, uh, kids pro, uh, I'll start off with, we had for worship, we did live stream worship uh, and our numbers, uh, I mean, just to, to, to put it in those terms, actually, increase because we had many folks who maybe weren't there week in and week out seeking, uh, seeking that spiritual uh, yearning. In uh, addition, we've tried to be innovative in the ways that we've reached folks. So uh, we, we have uh, small groups of folks who just, you know, you know, many of them older folks who may not know how to do Zoom, but they can do a phone call. And you have 20 plus folks in four or five different groups who were able to uh, just go on phone call and they pray with one another and they study uh, scripture. And in addition, we had, uh, we had many leaders uh, officially assigned just to make phone calls to members of the church to say, are you okay? Are you okay? Um, and with our youth programming, we had, we, we've had Zooms for our, everyone from kindergarten uh, all the way through high school. And we've uh, you tried to utilize some innovative, uh, well, you know, relatively innovative techniques such as, you know, we've had uh, Bible studies on YouTube. We, um, that's my son in the background, if you hear anything, but I hope you could still hear me. And what's nice, by the way, I also have a fake background, so you don't, you didn't see him trying to climb up just before. Um, but in, a, in addition, uh, we've had, uh, what was he? oh, uh, so like, for example, tonight, we have a uh, Facebook Live on Black Lives Matter that the, our young adults are hosting. And so, you know, we've been trying to do a, bo a, a both end. How can we still do what we do in new and fresh ways and reach people, uh, you know, differently? Um, and so, ha you know, I just mentioned that all to say, so as we 
think about reopening, uh, whatever that means. I mean, first, we will, uh, you know, I always like to say personally is we were never closed. It's just that, you know, this one aspect of the building was closed, right? But we were, we've always tried to be uh, the, the church for all people. And so as we consider opening, so we've, we have a, a, you know, tonight even we're having a meeting and we've been having meetings for the past uh, uh, month of just whenever that opening of worship occurs, what will that look like? It's not going to look like February 1st. It's not going to look like, um, uh, you know, you know, all the people just coming in. We're, we're going to have people coming in stages. We're going to encourage uh, vulnerable folks not to come because we have our live stream. Uh, we're going to have uh, everyone required to have, wear face masks. Uh, we, we've already had people come in to do um, massive sweeps in terms of uh, cleaning of both our uh, sanctuary and then also our community center. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we're going to have hand sanitizers all over for worship. And that, you know, so there's that. And, you know, we're not even thinking about that until, you know, July at the earliest, right? You know, because, and, you know, def and we're going to follow all the rules and regulations. Re Reverend, let me, let me jump Sorry? in on, on that because that raises like what was one of our first, uh, our first questions. So let me do that. Sure. And, then, and I'll ask to you and then, and then the, the, the rabbi and the imam, and then sure. get the question. Um, uh, what can the government do? to make your reopening and coming back to, to life, you know, even if it is over the course of several months and phases, what can the government do to assist uh, uh, your community? Not, not your community broadly, I mean specifically, like the church, the, the shuls, the mosques, what can the government do? What can help you need to help you reopen safely? Sure, I'll start with that question and then, you know, uh, give to other folks. Um, I'll say that the first and foremost, which I, I you know, I, I hope and trust is happening, is that uh, the guidelines of when things are opened are based off, like you've mentioned at the beginning, uh, science and health, right? Uh, and, you know, it's obviously weighing in all the other economic factors which affect all of us, including our own congregants. But uh, first and foremost, if you're, you know, opening up based off of those, and because, you know, that will dictate the culture of, of who, who else opens, and that, that helps us be uh, the safest we can be. And I'll just briefly add, of course, one of uh, the, you know, if, you, you know, you work uh, with us in terms of uh, uh, letting us know exactly what are the best safety measures, whether it's resources on, you know, on paper or, uh, you know, working to see what kind of practical resources can be delivered to help being from the sanitizers to the more robust things. Like I said, we're doing, we're, you know, we're trying to sweep that, you know, all of our buildings and we're going to have, you know, the, the, you mentioned the daily, you know, the, the daily testing of folks. So any resources to help with those practical safety measures would be helpful. I'll let others. I definitely, yeah. I definitely understand um, the need to share guidance. Like, for example, um, approaching, we're asking, um, do the guidelines still apply if, if the, uh, the, 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 the services are held outdoors? Um, I remember uh, when the, um, the curfew was imposed, we got uh, calls and, and, and communication from, from the Orthodox community. Well, you know, uh, evening services are after 8 p.m. So what happens if people are walking back and forth from uh, services? Uh, so so it is important to have very, very clear guidance. I know that the governor has a, um, uh, a clergy advisory task force, and I assume and hope that they're being uh, con consulted. Um, uh, Rabbi, what, was there anything that, that you got the government here? Um, I'm just one little councilman, but you know, uh. what, could we, what could we do to make it easier for the Orthodox community to, to reopen? Um, you know, we, we, we have, when you're talking, you're talking about from a religious standpoint, you're talking about from the other parts of our life? Yeah, no, 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 from the religious like standpoint. I don't mean like, you know, uh, help the businesses reopen or help people get their unemployment checks sooner. That's general. But in, 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 in particular, there are things that you know, the government could be doing better, that are, that are a particular concern, need, issue for, for Orthodox life. Right. 
so you know, I, I think the, 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 the government's a little bit slow to, to allow the opening up of houses of worship. Um, I think that, uh, you know, our community, thank God, is a very, very law-abiding, listening to instructions type of community. And I think, well, you know, a lot of us would really like to see the, the houses of worship open up a little faster. Um, and uh, especially, and I hate to say this, I don't mean to, I don't want to hit the hornet's nest, but when you see, a lot, you know, when you see um, groups getting together and protesting in the thousands and houses of worship are not open, kind of makes you wonder, you know, what's going on with that. And I think that, that that's a, a big, that's a very large concern in our community, um, trying to figure out what the difference is. So, you know, I'm not here to ask for that answer. That answer. I'm just saying is it seems that there's a hesitance to put, attach importance to the congregating of people to pray, which is so central to our community. Um, like I said earlier, from a religious standpoint and from an emotional standpoint. Uh, we had a, actually a conference call for Dr. Fauci with the Orthodox Union about a month ago about you know, getting back to our synagogues. And he, uh, he, he kept on asking for us to pray and he kept on emphasizing to us, and I'm sure he had this conversation with other faiths, how important it was, you know, the, the, the prayer and the faith-based part of, of, uh, of our community. So I, I think we'd like to see a little bit faster and a little bit more, uh, you know, got, with the guidelines, of course, but I think we'd like to see, you know, a little bit quicker moving on, on the religious gatherings. Imam, are we? Yeah, I, I think from us, uh, what we need to, uh, to see is less conflicting information from the government. You know, uh, in the past, we have seen a lot of confliction, conf uh, you know, conflicting informations. And uh, luckily that our people, you know, always coming to us and, and listening to what we say in our community. Um, in the past month, particularly May, we have Ramadan. It's not easy for Muslims to stay home because it's really a very important month for them to come together as community. And also at the end of Ramadan, Eid al-Fitr is a very important celebration. Uh, but luckily that our people are law abiding and they are listening to us. And so we uh, basically wanted to hear, uh, you know, an assurance from the government. So, you know, either it is safe to open or it's not safe to open. We just follow, you know, but we need an assurance from the government, not conflicting opinions that we listen around. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that during, uh, you know, many houses of worship are facing tremendous um, financial crisis. And I think luckily that in our Jamaica Muslim Center in the, in the past, during this pandemic crisis, you know, we are, we're able to help more than 700 families um, uh, in terms of, you know, basic foods that they need. Uh, also, we hand out some other assistance to them. And so we are still, you know, struggling, but, um, you know, many houses of worship, basically their income is coming from donations. And so we are looking forward to, to that opening, but at the same time, we need an assurance from government because we are listening to the governments, by the way. Yeah. You know, I can tell you and, and our audience as a, as a council member um, how much we rely on our houses of worship, our religious institutions, to provide services, to, to channel funnel services. I don't mean religious services. I mean food. I mean um, uh, helping seniors. I mean um, social work uh, through our, our nonprofit, our, our religious uh, institutions. Um, you know, so, so let me say two things. The first is, it's very important, and, and this is something that we will continue to, to fight for, to make sure that at the very least, the religious community, religious institutions are getting support on the same terms as everybody else, you know, and it was important for us to fight, to make sure that there was, in, in, the, in the, uh, the meal distributions, for example, at the schools, that there were, were kosher meals and that there were halal meals because the people with those religious uh, restrictions need to be part of, the, part of New York City as, as well. And whatever we're going to do going forward to uh, assist institutions, um, we need to make sure that religious communities are not improperly uh, excluded from that. And if we were smart, and I, and I hope that we will be smart, and I will try to contribute to, to, to us being smart, um, we will rely on our faith-based institutions to um, provide the kind of services that we're looking to, 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 to provide because a lot of them do it already. You know, Jamaica Muslim Center, you know, Imam, you mentioned we had, there's a senior citizen program there. There's a food pantry that's already there. I know the First Presbyterian Church um, does a tremendous amount of, <clears throat> of 
uh, services with a lowercase s, you know, assisting people, not, not religious services. And it'd be foolish for us to not take advantage of those, of those streams. Um, okay, next uh, question issue. Jennifer uh, Ferrioli, Jamaica Center, did uh, last week there was, a, there was a protest in downtown Jamaica. It was peaceful, it was orderly. People expressed themselves, in, in, in my district, uh, people expressed themselves without reservation. Um, uh, how are the merchants on Jamaica Avenue uh, uh, feeling about uh, the current situation? And are they just uh, uh, champing at the bit to, to reopen on, on Monday? It's Hello. funny, that's, I was just on with uh, Borough President Lee uh, right before I got on with you, and those were the exact words I used, chomping at the bit to open, to the point that some of them have opened and they're not quite that phase one yet. So um, we're doing an education process right now about when they can open, but um, I just have such admiration for our businesses in our district. They, um, they're so strong and they're, I, when I've spoken to them on the phone, they're just so full of grace and desire to do the right thing and to follow the guidelines and to open and serve their customers. And I've seen tremendous innovation. Um, we have a wonderful business called Meet Me Over uh, Beauty Bar. And these women very quickly transitioned to Instagram to um, connect with their customer base. So these businesses are doing everything they can to stay open. They want to be part of a thriving commercial district um, and they wanna do things right. You're right that that protest was very peaceful. We were so grateful for that. I think it was um, perfectly executed. I think people feel as optimistic as they can and they feel committed to, um, to make things work. Good, good to hear. All right, let's get to some questions from the audience. Um, and our first uh, participant is our old friend, Alan Sherman, a regular uh, on this program. Um, and Alan uh, has a question about um, street reopening, restaurants, et cetera. About a week ago, I had posed a question on Facebook, uh, whether or not there are streets in our neighborhood that might uh, uh, reopen so that the restaurants on those streets, uh, uh, well, they would reopen without being um, uh, for, for vehicles so that the restaurants could like have outdoor seating, et cetera, et cetera. So Alan, give the, the whole full question you have about the streets, et cetera. And then we'd love to hear from, uh, from Neil and from, from Jennifer, what uh, they think uh, merchants uh, would, would think about that. If I give the whole story, we'll be here forever. I'll, do, I'll give you a Reader's Digest version. You're gonna get. You're gonna give the thirty-second version, Bubba. Thirty-second version. Many people feel, especially in the Kew Gardens Hills area, that closing the Main Street service road will hurt businesses. There are large families in our neighborhood. There are elderly. There are people who rely on their cars. I've never heard of going to church on your bicycle and sitting there. You have to be in a car. COVID nineteen was tested from your car. Automobiles are more important now than ever before. Closing streets anywhere will hurt business and will hurt the people. We cannot let the far left um, special interests rule the majority of the people. Please don't close Main Street and leave it up to the community boards, not Corey Johnson who doesn't live here. Leave it up to the community boards to decide which streets should be closed and got when it. they should be reopened again. We got it. Good. So um, I want to go to Neil and then and then Jennifer. So um, Jennifer, this is far from Main Street and Kew Gardens Hills is far from anywhere you know near the Jamaica uh, downtown district. Um, Queens Chamber Co Commerce, you've got everything. Um, there is an effort, and I'm supportive of it broadly, to um, find streets where it would make sense to open the street, uh, uh, or, or rather close the street and let restaurants um, uh, open and have outdoor door seating. Um, and I know Queens reasonably well, that might work in some neighborhoods and might not, not, might not work in others. Neil, can you, are you familiar with that, that effort? How are you um, uh, 
trying to figure out where that would that would work. Um, and, and you don't need to like opine on the, the, the mainstream Kew Garden Tales, but like generally. Yeah, so I think it's it's one of those things. It, it goes back to your point of it's where does it make sense to, right. to do that? Um, you know, we are, as Jen said, we've had so many different businesses that have had to pivot or, or do new innovative things to, to be able to make some money. And we do think that, you know, opening up the streets and having people be able to, to eat outside would be really helpful for some businesses right now. But, um, you know, Unfortunately, it's it's one of those things where they might run into issues like, you know, Mr. Sherman just mentioned. So I think as, as long as it's something that makes sense and it's something that the, you know, DOT is, is good with and they can give us proper guidelines, um, I think that's kind of how we need to move forward is just do that where it makes sense. Uh, Jen, um, anything you could tell us? I don't know if any of the streets in downtown Jamaica would lend themselves to, to that, um, but... Yeah. Right. So one of the challenges that downtown Jamaica has right now is we don't have enough sit down restaurants. Um, we have actually been helping to attract more. So we're not one of those vibrant restaurant districts where this would necessarily make sense. There is a one to two block span. When this proposal started to be floated, I thought, okay, there's a one to two block span where there's a cluster of um, mostly Salvadorian restaurants and a Dominican restaurant where maybe that might, you know, maybe there could be sort of a little parklet. Um, but again, I, my approach would be first, I want to reach out to those businesses and say, would this benefit you? I eat at those restaurants a lot. I've noticed that while they do a good business, they often do a takeout business as is. And when I've sat in there, even before coronavirus, there was a lot of space between tables. So they may not need that. And the last thing I would ever want to do is, um, ram something down the throats of my businesses that would be more of a hassle and a coordination for them. Um, but we have mapped it out as a possibility. Um, and my first step then would be to talk to those businesses. If it's desirable, then of course we would want to speak to the community board, the neighboring businesses as well, and see if that would benefit them. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's true that what works in some neighborhoods doesn't work in others. And Queens is very vehicle dependent and the streets are used in a different sense. And so um, we just have to be mindful when, when these proposals come out. In concept, I, I think it's a great idea for certain neighborhoods. I just, I'd wanna be very cautious before, you know, applying that to ours. Thank you very much. I, it's definitely a, a, a street by street determination yep. that, that has to be made. Um, okay, uh, next question is um, on uh, schools and from, uh, I think uh, the name is Y Zhang. So uh, Mr. or Mrs. Zhang, Mr. Ms. Zhang, you're up. Go ahead, you, you have been unmuted. Mr. or Ms. Zhang? Okay, all right, uh, Sam, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, that question, those questions for him. Said, and actually I'm gonna be the one answering them, so it's convenient. Um, the first question had to do, is CUNY opening up in the fall? The answer is we don't know yet. SUNY, I believe, has made a determination that it will be opening up in the fall. Um, my two daughters go to SUNY Binghamton, and that's what they tell me. Uh, maybe they just want an excuse to be up in Binghamton uh, and not home with me and my wife after three months. Um, but my understanding is SUNY has made a decision that it is going to be opening up. CUNY has not yet made that decision. This was as of a couple of days ago. As for the schools, the New York City Public Schools, Likewise, a, a final decision has not been made, but I happen to know that the intention is to open the schools, that um, there may be um, alternate uh, days for kids to attend so that social distancing can be maintained. Uh, there are issues that have to be worked out, obviously, with the cleaning and maintenance of the, the schools. We have excellent custodians 
in New York City schools, um, but this is something that is more than, than what they're usually used to. So uh, let's make sure that, that they get the extra support and services uh, that they need. But it is, it is the unofficial intention to open the schools for the fall. Now, with that said, you know, God forbid, uh, we have a second wave in July, which has happened in some jurisdictions where they've opened up too early or, or haven't opened up smartly. Um, things could be different. Um, let me ask uh, the, the faith leaders on, <clears throat> on the call. Um, Imam Shamsi Ali, I know that uh, you had mentioned that, that, that there are a couple of schools associated with the Jamaica Muslim Center, but um, uh, in terms of the, the schools that are run by the Muslim community, what is the plan for opening uh, over the summer, over the fall, et cetera? But you're still, you're still muted. You're still muted. There you go. <laughs> Our full-time school basically followed the uh, state um, uh, regulations, so we just follow the, uh, the state's um, regulations. If they open up, we are going to open up as well. Um, but uh, in terms of our traditional uh, midrash, it's very much depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the situations that we are facing now. So I, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, but again, so, you know, we are taking every step that we are taking with full precautions, everything else, because is about our well-being of a community and the safety of community and neighborhood as well. Rabbi, um, what are the yeshivas looking at, 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 at doing? We have a lot of, uh, in my district in particular, but all throughout Central Queens. Right. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll echo what, uh, what the Imam said. We we're also waiting for, you know, the state guidelines and the state direction. I can tell you that a big topic of conversation in our community, Lori, as you know, thank God we have uh, large families and we have a lot of young children. Um, a big topic of conversation is the day camps and the sleepaway camps. And, you know, I can tell you, thank God, as a father of seven children, um, all cooped up for the last two and a half months, you know, uh, Besiakov and, and uh, my, my daughter's high school and my boys uh, have been, you know, learning and, and, and being instructed by the most wonderful teachers in the world. One of them happens to be my wife. But the, the uh, and that's been keeping the kids going. Uh, the problem now is going to be as school comes to an end and we are hitting the summer, you know, we were in the city, cities are, the city's hot, the, you know, it's the, the concrete jungle, as they say. And um, I know that the governor said that June 29th camps can open, but we're awaiting what, what those guidelines are for day camps. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of parents come to me and they say, they don't know if they want to send their kids to day camps under the current situation, you know, who knows? Uh, what, what those guys are going to look like. And then, of course, we have the sleepaway camps, which is a tremendously large part of our community. It's a very big, uh, it's a very big part of the, of the summer experience in our community. Kids going away upstate to the Catskills. Um, we, we don't know anything about that yet either. Um, I just saw right now that Dr. Fauci uh, said it's time to start to think about reopening the schools. So I don't know what that means exactly. But, you know, which of course, uh, we're, we're going to follow the guidelines or we're going to follow whatever the state mandates and tells us to do. So like, like the imam said, we're waiting. We'd love to get them open. <laughs> Reverend, um, is, does the First Presbyterian uh, run a school? Are there other, other uh, schools that, that um, uh, from the uh, Presbyterian church or Protestant community that you could tell us about? Yeah, sure. So we, we don't run a school ourselves. All I, can, all I can think of, I mean, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, from what I know from the Catholic uh, folks who are, are trying to navigate this, I mean, it's pretty much echoing what the, the um, Imam and Rabbi is saying. He's trying to figure it out, take the safety precautions. So. Got it. Okay, good. Um, so uh, there was a question that uh, I said something that might have been con confusing. My understanding is that phase two, a, a jurisdiction is eligible for phase two, one month after the start of phase one. Sam, if you can Google that, and if I'm giving out wrong information, you, you, you let me know. But that's my understanding. Um, someone in the Q&A, an anonymous person, so otherwise I'd let them speak, uh, seemed to, to think that it was on June 22nd, the phase two reopening, but, but that's not my understanding. So, and obviously that phase two can't start unless the, the, the criteria for phase two are met, but it has, phase one has to go on for at least 
um, a month. But Sam, you j jump on the, the 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 Zoom if I'm giving if that's if that's wrong information. Um, no problem. So um, let me ask uh, just a couple more questions, and then we'll let everybody go. I actually have to go to. There's an enormous. Uh, hopefully, it's an enormous rally. Uh, in memory of, of George Floyd and, and the issues in connection to that at 3 p.m. at Borough Hall. So um, let me go back to our business folks. Uh, if uh, um, how does someone know if they're in an industry and a region that is permitted to reopen? You know, you have a person, they own a business, whatever it is. Like, can they can they reach out to your organizations? Is, do you know, is there a website they can go to? And do they do they need to 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 to, to ask permission, or do they need to, to fill out any kind of form, or like what do they have to do to, to pull up the gates and open up shop? Jennifer, you look like you look. Yep. Like you so so um, I'm going to direct people to our website. Um, it's Jamaica.nyc, and then with on that website we have a COVID nineteen page. And from there, we have a whole reopening section. And you'll find the link then to the state's reopening section, which they have a wonderful tool. You can actually enter in your borough and then the type of business you are. And it'll actually pull up if you're eligible to open. And then in addition to that, depending on uh, what phase we're in, they have a whole handy list of resources for you. So I actually printed this out, um, for example, for the retail, I don't know if you can see it, but they have all of the mandatory things you need to do, and then they have recommended best practices. Um, in addition, all businesses need to, essential or not, um, need to have a safety operating plan. And that doesn't mean you're gonna have to turn that in to anybody, but you have to have it ready and you have to have it on site. And um, New York State has actually made it pretty easy for you. They have a template so you can fill it out. And a lot of it is just sort of checking off. Yes, I agree to do this, this, this. Um, and I believe that those safety templates are even designed for particular industries. So um, that's where I would start. And then when you go to our website also in that reopening section, we have links to, um, I wanna to mention that QEDC, Queens Economic Development Corporation and Queens Chamber are doing a whole bunch of webinars that are really, really helpful um, about reopening. And those will answer some of your questions. And then I believe it's tomorrow, but um, council member, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the city is going to be launching a business restart phone hotline. Um, as soon as we know that number, we'll post it. But I think that's going to be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, we will definitely include that in our daily uh, the email blast. Um, Neil, can you uh, tell folks uh, what what kind of resources uh, is available that in the Queen's Chamber of Commerce and guiding them through all these 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 questions? And yeah, sure. So we also have a, a, a spot on our website that's queenschamber.org where people can go and look up various different uh, COVID nineteen related resources that we have available. Um, we've done a, a large series of webinars the last couple of weeks. All of those uh, have been recorded and can be found on our Facebook page. Um, we also have a number of events coming up here. Uh, we have cybersecurity for small businesses, uh, small business navigation of COVID-19, that's uh, on June 9th. Uh, uh, we have a webinar on PPP and EIDL next steps on June 9th as well. Um, we just we're constantly adding new webinars at our website in queenschamber.org. So I'd recommend you guys check that out. Um, under that COVID-19 resources uh, tab that we have, I mean, we have lists of uh, cleaning services that are available. We have, you know, links to business organizations like Jen or the QEDC, like that she mentioned. Um, Seth and Rob and that whole team, they put together an incredible amount of resources. So I'd really encourage everyone to go to QEDC's website as well. Um, you know, they'll, 
they'll be able to get you some great information. And then honestly, if you don't know where to go, you could always reach out to us at the chamber. We might not know the answer, but we can help you find someone that can tell you how to, to you know, get what you need. So, um, you know, you can contact us on our social media pages, um, or you can always email me. It's just nwagner at queenschamber.org. And I'll put that into the, the chat box here, so. All right, excellent. Um, we do have one, uh, hyper-local question for, for Rabbi Schwartz, and because I love him, I'm going to ask it to him. Uh, David Englander. Yes. And Sam, can, can we bring uh, David Englander so he can ask his, his, his question of Rabbi Schwartz? David, you're up. Yeah, hi. How are you? Hi. I don't know why I can't see you. Uh, Rabbi Schwartz. Hi, how are you, David? Awesome. Uh, do you think Monday... With phase one, will they increase the minyanum from 10 people? New Jersey, you can dive in with 25 people. Right, so I, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe looking at the guidelines, I think it's going to stick to 10. Um, uh, uh, Councilman, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, the, the guidelines say it'll stick to 10. I believe and, it is currently 10. Currently and I think in phase one, it's 10 as well. Yeah. Um, no, no, okay. no, yes, yes, that's correct. Currently 10, phase one is also right. going to be 10. So, Ms. Angander, I, I, I wish I could tell you that we're going to have 25 people, 30 people, 100 people, but uh, it looks like that's not changing that quickly. And, um, you know, we, we, what we can do, I, I, I neglected to say on this uh, earlier that uh, many shoals have been, been extremely creative in what they're doing. Um, I know in our shoal, in Kew Gardens, where I'm a member, in um, uh, Congregation of Dasi Ram, We've staggered the the uh, minyanim. We've staggered the prayer the prayer groups, seven like you know Saturday morning, seven, eight, and nine, or uh, I think we have one at seven, then two at nine, one upstairs and in, in, in the in the other room, and downstairs uh, ten upstairs, ten downstairs. There's also many synagogues have had uh, registry in Google Groups, Google Docs, where if you want to come to a specific time slot, you have to register and you have to commit to be there actually, because as you know, uh, ten we cannot pray without a quorum of ten. So you have to be there. So I, I think um, I think it's going to be a while until we have large groups. That won't and change till uh, till phase two. It doesn't look like I, I don't know. I, again, I can't speak for the for for, for, the, for the state, but I, I think my my councilman. I think uh, am I correct? That it's I think that that's the right. I think that is the correct framework. That the religious services are limited to ten. We know that presently. Phase one is ten now just as an accommodation was made uh, in our current situation to go from, from, from no services to, to 10, maybe somewhere in the middle of phase one, there will be a, uh, uh, an expansion of, of that. I, could also, um, I also want to point out something that's been very interesting. I just want to share it with the group here, is that, you know, uh, thank God uh, when our community is uh, marriage is, a, is, a, uh, is an extremely uh, central part of, 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 of any religion, but of our religion, you know, we, we encourage our, 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 uh, our children to get married young. So we, we have, a, you know, we have a lot of weddings and, uh, you know, and, and it's been a tremendous challenge. Um, you know, weddings also require, because it's a religious celebration, it requires a minion, it requires 10 people. And um, our community, I just want to tell you, has stepped up. Uh, people in our community have donated their backyards they have large backyards. In particular, there's one fellow in particular, Hugh Garden Hills, I don't want to say his name, who has, who has a lot, where you're able to accommodate with social distancing and be able to have the religious observance of having a chuppah, of having a, a marriage uh, that we're used to. Of course, you know, it's not the big, you know, Orthodox weddings that uh, you've already, you know, you're used to seeing four or 500 people. But, you know, uh, I guess my mother, my mother always says that necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, you have those people that have stepped up and, 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 um, and, and given of their, of their property, of their homes, of their backyards, to be able to accommodate uh, that, that, that important uh, marriage ceremony, so. Trust me, tw Rabbi, 20 years from now, people uh, are gonna, gonna, gonna say, uh, you know, during the, the, the crisis, I got married in the coronavirus lot. It's gonna be like, you know, I fought in World War II. I, right. I, was, in, I was in Normandy. That's um, right. Imam? Yeah, I, um, I have officiated two marriages in the last um, um, month uh, through Zoom, by the way, through virtual <laughs> appreciation. And we have done that. And um, I think um, we consider that is a, a special and uh, people are just happy. 
of, of that. You know, by the way, I'm talking into about a virtual program that we have, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have already have our Zoom and uh, every day. In fact, during the month of Ramadan, we have twice, basically, at six o'clock and nine o'clock in the evening, we have lectures. And even now, it's still continuing, uh, delivering our services and lectures, sermons uh, through um, Zoom and Facebook Live. We have hundreds of people attending on, on our Facebook, uh, official, Jamaica Muslim State officials. And I'm sure that this is one of the blessings that the pandemic brought to us uh, because we can connect with our community even through you know, uh, these um, uh, means. And um, uh, we are going to continue this. Even, in, you know, even if we are opening, we are still to continue because not every uh, person can come to the mosque every time. So I think it's a good way to connect with our community. And um, I'm, I'm very much you know, appreciative and thankful to God for that opportunity as well. You know, that's a very, very interesting observation. And, and I think, you know, all of us have, have thought it at some point, you know, we've all adjusted our lives the way we do things in, in just dramatic, dramatic ways. And you wonder how many of the things that we're doing now, should we still do? Or can we incorporate once things become, you know, normal? Certainly, um, you know, <laughs> I, I would rather not have to schlep down to the to, to City Hall five days a week from from my house in Hillcrest, you know, maybe having more meetings on Zoom uh, is is something that we should we should we should do. Obviously, each faith has to figure out the the, the religious aspects of, of what that means for them and how they're going to do it. Um, but certainly, just in terms of the day to day operation of our organizations, whether it's a legislature, a business, a, a church, a mosque, a, a synagogue. Um, Probably from this sort of things, we're gonna we're gonna learn how to do some things a little differently and better that we're gonna wanna that we're gonna wanna uh, retain. Um, uh, Imam uh, Shamsi Ali, you get the you've got the last word there. I've kept you all for uh, a little longer than I than I had thought. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Imam uh, Ali, the Jamaica Muslim Center, um, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz from the Vad Harabonim of Queens. Uh, Reverend uh, Della Cruz from First Presbyterian Church, uh, Jennifer uh, Ferrioli from the Jamaica uh, uh, Business Improvement District, uh, and Neil Wagner pitching in uh, ably, pinch hitting ably for Tom Gretsch um, at the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Now, let me remind everybody who's still watching and listening, my office continues to be open for business. You can call us, 718 217-4969. You can email us at rlancement and council.myc.gov. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. You can go to my council website. If you need me, there's no reason you can't, you can't get me. So um, everyone, thank you for participating. Stay safe, and I'll see you in person, hopefully, soon enough. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.